So from the late 80s, even up until now, um, 2021, um, I studied with, um, I studied and studied, study with some of the ulama and the basic sciences, theology, fiqh, um, suluk, spirituality. I have some authorizations or ijazats in that. Uh, my secular background is that uh, in the uh, in the early 80s, I started a degree in astrophysics. I never completed it, but I did follow it up as a, you know, uh, in later days. So I kind of do keep up with that kind of side of things, that kind of side of science. Uh, it's a passion of mine. In reality, uh, there doesn't have to be a dichotomy. It doesn't have to be um, science or God or science or religion. It can quite comfortably be uh, science and religion. There are, you know, uh, possibly tens of thousands of, of Muslims, uh, quite often young, uh, gifted uh, men and women, Muslim men and women who are entering, entering into university, into college, uh, and they're confronted with these issues. Um, and they turn to uh, sources in the Muslim community to find answers. Um, often they feel let down. And then there are uh, people who aren't, you know, students or whatever. There are, you know, there are just uh, seasoned adults who themselves, they, they're not quite sure. As parents, I'm not quite sure what to tell my children. I gave a talk in uh, one of the uh, uh, Islamic society uh, um, events uh, in, uh, in London in one of the universities in London. And this university in London is one of the uh, uh, universities for medicine in, in London. It's one of the premier uh, universities for uh, doing medicine. And uh, I said, oh, normally we have uh, talks on Wednesday. The Islamic societies normally have talks on Wednesday because uh, Wednesday is like half day for most universities. They said, yeah, no, we decided to do it on Thursday because we just had a biology class. I said, oh, so what, a, bio a biology class now? And uh, the brother said, yes. I said, oh, but this room is fully attended. Like there's like there's about, you know, 60, 80 people here. But did they all kind of not attend biology or whatever? He said, yes. I said, oh, right. I said, why is that? He said, oh, it's just evolution. And none of us Muslims, we don't attend any class on evolution. I said, why? He said, oh, because it's just, it's all rubbish, right? I said, you know, had you not been studying medicine, I probably would have let that go. Bismillah, that's your view. Khalas, what can you say? It's not, you know, but you're, you're just studying medicine, right? You can't be having that view. And so, I, you know, we went through some of, of these issues and whatever. I think about a, a month later, two months later, uh, they called me for another talk. And this time I noticed it was on a Wednesday. And the brother then writes to me saying, we're all attending the classes evolution or not, you know, we get it now, alhamdulillah. Continue to ask Allah. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها Allah does not burden a soul beyond that which it can bear. So Allah is giving you, you know, what you can handle. Allah would, would not overburden you. So may Allah make it easy for you. Continue to make dua and trust Allah that he will make it easy. Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْأُسْرِ يُسْرَى That indeed after hardship there is ease. Now, if you listen to Numan Ali Khan's like tafsir of this, Allah says that twice. Indeed after the hardship there is ease. Indeed after the hardship there is ease. And with the Arabic, Allah says al, like the hardship in both sentences, implying it's the same one hardship. And then when Allah says ease, he just says ease. He doesn't say the ease. So that's implying that for every one hardship, and it's not like huge difficulty. It's just um, any minor difficulty. There's two amazing blessings of ease that come your way. Some scholars say it's just two eases generally. One, so others say one in this life, one in the next. Wallahu alam. Allah says these are days that we flip between the people, good and bad. And this doesn't have to be days. Uh, it could be, you know, years, uh, just situations. You're in. But trust Allah that he will make the situation easy for you eventually and that you will get out of this eventually. And don't lose hope in Allah. Uh, Allah says, um, this, in this context, Allah says, you know, those who committed sins, obviously you haven't committed a sin here, but Allah says, do not despair in the mercy of Allah. So I want to pass that message forward to you. Do not lose hope in the mercy of Allah. 
don't think that Allah, you know, will not alleviate you of the situation. Definitely Allah will, inshallah. And uh, if you don't find some kind of refuge in this life, you will find a beautiful reward in the hereafter. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, you are now tuned in once again to the realest podcast in the dunya, The Three Muslims. You are joined with your hosts, Bayad Rami and Angel. We got a very special guest today, Sheikh Abu Alia. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Yeah, so Sheikh, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself for any new viewers that don't know um, who you are or aren't familiar with much of your work. Um. Uh, truth be told, uh, Brother Fire, there's not much to, to tell. Um, I um, born and bred in London. Um, I started kind of, um, to use the phrase, I started practicing Islam back in the mid 80s. Uh, there wasn't much going on either here or over across the waters in the United States at that time. Um, I started working um, uh, I started getting into, into Dawah in the mid 80s and there was a, there was an organization, uh, called Jimas uh, in the UK. Um, I was uh, one of the main workers along with that organization for a, a number of years. Um, by the late 80s, um, doing Dawah without any formal studying uh, obviously showed itself with mistakes, errors, um, sometimes harshness, sometimes being strict when there was no reason to be strict, sometimes being too lenient when actually there was firmness required because there wasn't a legitimate difference of opinion. And the only way to resolve that was to actually start studying formally. So from the late eighties, even up until now, um, 2021, um, I studied with, um, I studied and studied, study with some of the ulama and the basic sciences, theology, fiqh, um, suluk, spirituality. I have some authorizations or ijazats in that. Uh, my secular background is that uh, in the uh, in the early 80s, I started a degree in astrophysics. I never completed it, but I did follow it up as a, you know, uh, in later days. So I kind of do keep up with that kind of side of things, that kind of side of science. Uh, it's a passion of mine. Um, I have a, a website called thehumbleye.com um, and... I blog, translate uh, on there. And from the last 30 odd years, I, I've been teaching um, and doing classes, um, talks, conferences, the usual, the, the usual stuff uh, with the usual culprits. <laughs> SubhanAllah. That's Rami, pretty about uh, it, really, mashallah. Rami, are you mind blown? What an intro. Yeah, SubhanAllah, mashallah. Astrophysics, eh? Uh, yeah, but don't, don't ask me too much. I, 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 I stopped in the um, uh, by the second year, and I decided that I'm going to go into full time Islamic uh, Islamic studies and start learning, you know, Sharia and Deen. So that's what happened, really. Subhanallah, may Allah reward you for that. I mean, Barakallah and may Allah bless you all, mashallah, and it's a pleasure to be on your show, Alhamdulillah, and a pleasure to meet you all uh, for the first time, mashallah. Um, I'm sensing that you're three different characters that all oh, yeah. come together in one 100%, 100%. eclectic mix, mashallah. Uh, <laughs> alhamdulillah, I'm sure it makes for a brilliant podcast with you, lot. alhamdulillah. May Allah reward you, you know, and uh, thank you. The pleasure is mine for inviting you. I mean, you're up. I mean, you as well, yeah. Uh, so, quick thing before Rami uh, takes over. Um, you know, any of your links, any of your websites, your socials, I'm going to link all of them in the description box. So for anyone watching this far, if you want to follow along, get more of Sheikh Abu Alia, you will know where to find him, inshallah. Rami, uh, take it over, man. So all many right. people are before, confused today. Before Rami goes, What's up? I, uh, put your other earbud in. Because you got your mic that's like rubbing on your jacket. Oh, yeah, bro. I'll just hold that noise. Okay. All right. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, take over, man, because we live in a world today where people think it's either evolution for God. Yeah, yeah, that is, I actually opened a DM. I, I, I made a post and on my post, someone commented, open my DM. So I'm like, okay, okay, chill. I open the DM. There's like a list of questions. And one of those is, the first one is evolution in Islam. There's so much proof for evolution. How can Islam be true if evolution is true? And it's a lot of people still think it's a really big problem. So mm -hmm. 
could you please get into that a little bit more and talk about how science and Islam can be compatible, even when dealing with, with evolution in some sense? Alhamdulillah, bismillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, ma ba'd. Um, it is a problem. It's a problem worldwide. It's not just a problem uh, within Muslim communities. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem even with um, uh, atheistic communities. I've come across atheists and agnostics who um, are very skeptical uh, of science. Of course, it's not for them science or God, but they're skeptical of science. They're skeptical of evolution. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it, it has, uh, especially in the Western world, uh, for the last four, 400 years or more, it has become one of those uh, cliched things, science or religion, science or God. Um, and that, is, that has a lot to do with uh, uh, Western history, Christianity in the West, more than it actually has to do with the history of Islam per se. Um, and and those those of you and those of the viewers who've, who've read about it and uh, will understand what uh, what I mean. But in reality, uh, there doesn't have to be a dichotomy. There, it doesn't have to be Islam, uh, you know, um, science or God or science or religion. It can quite comfortably, without twisting, in the case of Islam, without twisting. Uh, uh, the texts of Revelation, the text of the Quran, or the or the sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it can quite comfortably be uh, science and religion. Okay, um, that is not to say that we believe that the Quran is a book of science, and nor that it contains, nor necessarily that it contains explicit scientific verses. That is not to say it does or it doesn't. It's just to say that its main focus is what? A book of guidance to connect us to the creator of creation. That it talks about things to do with the natural world. That it talks about things to do with uh, creatures in the sea, uh, creatures in the air. That it talks about some some things to do with mountains and how firm they are that it may talk about in certain verses to do with the growth of the uh, of an infant child within the womb of its mother uh, they are not there primarily as kind of scientific uh, evidences or statements they're primarily there as ethical um, spiritual uh, devotional uh, teachings which connect us to to God but what is remarkable perhaps uh, and I don't know how you all feel about this it's remarkable not so much that oh there are statements in the Quran that agree with modern science but flip it on its head um, modern science has yet to show anything where it's incompatible with what the Quran is saying for a book that was revealed 1400 years ago, where the dominant um, scientific paradigms were vastly different than what they were, what they are now, um, for you know, for that to be the case, that there is nothing that modern science has come up with, which clearly contradicts an uh, explicit, unequivocal verse or meaning of a verse in the Quran, that in itself is subhanallah. That's worth pondering. You know, I think. Yeah, 100% subhanAllah. And we find a lot of the time um, da'is, they, they use uh, scientific miracles in the Quran to argue for Islam. Um, how do you feel about that, that line of arguing? So, for example, uh, th there is a verse in the Quran uh, that, will, that will speak about how the heavens and the earth were once joined and then God split them asunder. Or um, how... Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God is, uh, uh, is expanding the heavens. So let's take the last one. God is expanding the heavens. So I have a classical book of a Muslim commentary, tafsir book, uh, at home. I'm, 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 I'm sure I'm not the only student of knowledge that has that. I'm sure many other people around the world have it. Uh, it's by a Spanish scholar, uh, one of the Andalusian scholars in the uh, fifth Islamic century or sixth Islamic century, he wrote it. And when he comes, so that's, you know, sixth Islamic century, we're talking about around about the kind of the medieval period, the 12th century of the common era. 
right? Okay, just 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 after the last of the Crusades, all right? Um, when when the modern United States wasn't quite a nation yet, not until the next five six hundred years, uh, and 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 Britain had certain kings doing what kings do, and this Spanish scholar, Muslim scholar, writes under uh, uh, comments under the verse, and we are expanding the heavens. And he says, the scholars of tafsir, the scholars of Quranic explanation, say it has three, one of three or four meanings. And, and these meanings go back to some of the Sahaba and the Tabi'un, some of the companions and their, and their students. He says, one of the verses, uh, 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 one of the sayings, we're expanding the heavens means we're sending rain down from the sky. God is sending rain down from the sky. Uh, another uh, another uh, opinion: We are called uh, God causes vegetation to grow from the earth. Another opinion is I think I think it's sending the wind, and then a fourth op opinion he says, uh, or it could just mean the heavens are expanding, and he says they are not. It could apply to all. They are not mutually exclusive. Wallahu alam, and Allah, and God knows best. And he moves on to the next verse. Um, so it's possible that uh, that verse might be speaking about the heavens expanding in terms of uh, modern cosmology, Big Bang, expansion of the universe. It could be. But generally, as I said before, the primary function of that verse is not to make us think, oh, Big Bang, exp expanding universe. Primarily, it's just to show uh, how kind God is. And how grateful we should be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for giving us all these, these blessings and these wonderful things. If someone then goes around and say, this is the meaning of the verse, uh, that's a brave person. Because what we're actually saying is God intends by this verse X, Y, Z. Now, either God intends and I have spoken the truth about him or I've lied on God. However, that's very different than saying it is possible. It's within the Quranic scope of that verse without twisting the Arabic or, you know, reading into it um, alien things. It's possible that that verse might be hinting at, amongst other things, amongst other things, the expansion of the universe. But Allah knows best. So one could make a, a, a person of serious Islamic learning, you know, if she or he is a student or a scholar of the Islamic sciences, I suspect that they would be cautious in how they state something because they understand stating something about Islam is saying God says, and either I'm speaking truthfully on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or I'm not. So, um, so they would probably state it as a possibility rather than a hard given fact. And then I can kind of brush my fingernails and say, you know, look how brilliant Islam is. We, you know, we invented modern science before you blinked. Yeah. Amazing answer. Um, and I think it's really important. And I'm glad that you that you highlighted the fact that it's a possibility um, because a lot of people go with this um, scientific form of argumentation for the Quran itself. And then when people find something uh, in the Quran and then interpret it in a uh, a non-scientific manner, right? Something that does not align with 21st century science on, uh, or scientific understanding or scientific narrative. They say, look, Islam is wrong. So that's why I find it such a big problem, especially mm -hmm. when dealing with evolution, because why are we now using our, uh, you know, the empirical method and the inductive methods of 21st century science as the, uh, the fundamental basis? Why are we using that as the, um, the uh, grading tools essentially for Islam? It, it should be the other way around, as you said. So um, bringing it back to the topic of evolution, which, again, is, is such a big problem to so many people. Um, how do you see evolution in your eyes? Is it something that is a straight up lie? Is it a hoax? Is there validity to it? You know, one of the eighth century Muslim scholars, uh, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziya, um, he has uh, a nice verse in a, a long poem that he wrote, a long creedal po poem. And in it, he mentions how what, has co what corrupts knowledge and the world is when people, uh, when people 
turn their backs on tafsir, on the, on the nuances, on the details. Um, so for example, um, and um, you know, I think, um, you know, please forgive, uh, and, um, you know, I, uh, please forgive me in terms of the viewers, if I'm going to mention something that some of the viewers might not be familiar with. Um, um, but in Islam, we have this issue of taqlid, okay, which can range from being called blind following to the other angle, following qualified scholarship. It's a following of someone without knowing their background proof. And in Islam, it's called taqlid. So when the scholars are, when the classical scholars are asked, uh, is this taqlid, this kind of trust for authority, is it something allowed in Islam or not? They will say, it's not a, it's not a single case. There is a type of taqlid which is forbidden in Islam, and there is a type of taqlid which is prescribed, and it's sometimes even obligated in Islam. Uh, it, it, you know, there's nuances, there, there's distinctions and, and detail. Um, it seems to me that something as complex as evolution and its vast scope of what it says uh, is like that. Uh, there are distinctions, there are certain parts of evolution that a, a Muslim committed to the texts of revelation um, sh uh, shouldn't feel uncomfortable with. Then there are things that evolution states uh, that the Muslim should feel uncomfortable with, uh, and it will be an issue of, can I square the circle? But we won't know that until two things. Firstly, that we understand what evolution is saying in some detail. And secondly, uh, what Islam and its theology uh, is saying in some level of detail. Uh, without knowledge of this or that, uh, one couldn't make any definitive claims. So if someone says, oh, evolution doesn't agree with agree with Islam, or, or the other way around, evolution is completely compatible with Islam. Uh, those generic absolutist statements, um, I suspect couldn't be made from someone who understands evolution fairly well and Islamic theology fairly well, and Allah knows best. Yeah, Allahu Alam, Jazakallah Khair. So uh, we, I hear a lot about how Dar, uh, Darwin himself uh, was a deist for a lot of his life. He believed in God for, for a lot of his life. And then there was a little fluctuation in that. Um, and he himself gave a number of things where he said, if these things fail, my theory fail. Like gradualism is one. And we find, uh, I hear we're finding today, gradual, gradualism is failing. Um, and you, you find other mechanisms of uh, evolution for evolution that are being brought about. Um, neogenetics, neo, uh, neo-Darwinism, so on and so forth. Um, what would you say the the common understanding of evolution uh, as wholesomely as possible is today? Okay, so uh, if I wind back a little and say that, um, um, if you permit me, um, I have um, eight or nine points or nine or ten points I'd like to uh, make. And within those nine or ten points, I hope, inshallah, that between ourselves... Uh, and the viewers, the audience, uh, we can collectively kind of join the dots and come to some kind of um, some kind of answer, even if that answer isn't definitive. But I I feel it's worth going through things step by step, um, as laborious uh, as it uh, may seem. One because it is a really pertinent question. There are you know. Uh, possibly tens of thousands of, of Muslims, uh, quite often young, uh, gifted uh, uh, men and women, Muslim men and women who are entering, in, entering into university, into college, uh, and they're confronted with these issues um, and they turn to uh, sources in the Muslim community to find answers. Um, often they feel let down. And sometimes some of them uh, make up their own minds um, though it might be ill-judged of what they think about Islam, sometimes uh, it, it weighs heavily on them. 
Um, and then there are people who aren't, you know, students or whatever. There, you know, there are just seasoned adults who themselves they they're not quite sure. As parents, I'm not quite sure what to tell my children. I remember back in the late '90s, I gave a I gave a talk in uh, one of the uh, uh, Islamic Society uh, um, events uh, in uh, in London, in one of the universities in London. And this university in London is one of the uh, uh, universities for medicine in, in London. It's one of the premier uh, universities for uh, doing medicine. And uh, I said, oh, normally we have uh, talks on Wednesday. The Islamic societies normally have talks on Wednesday because uh, Wednesday is like half day for most universities. They said, yeah, no, we decided to do it on Thursday because we just had a biology class. I said, oh, so what, a biology, a biology class now? And uh, the brother said, yes. I said, oh, but this room is fully attended. Like there's like there's about, you know, 60, 80 people here. But did they all kind of not attend biology or whatever? He said, yes. I said, oh, right. I said, why is that? He said, oh, it's just evolution. And none of us Muslims, we don't attend any class on evolution. I said, why? He said, oh, because it's just, it's all rubbish, right? I said, you know, had you not been studying medicine, I probably would have let that go. Bismillah, that's your view. Khalas, what can you say? It's not, you know, but you're, you're studying medicine, right? You can't be having that view. And so, I, you know, we went through some of, of these issues and whatever. I think about a, a month later, two months later, uh, they called me for another talk. And this time I noticed it was on a Wednesday. And the brother then writes to me saying, we're all attending the classes, evolution or not, you know, we get it now, alhamdulillah. Um, so it is a big issue. Um, a lot of people, even before Muslims, uh, Christians uh, in, in the beginning of the 19th, 20th century faced the barrage. Many people lost their, their Christian faith and Christian belief. There are Muslims who have apostatized and felt that they've lost their faith because of this. So it is an important thing. So let, let me lay my cards on the table from, from the outset. I, I can only look at this from uh, what we consider to be a, a normative orthodox point that is from a, a point of view of examining evolution in light of the quran the sunnah and the consensus or ijma uh, of the scholars uh, that's really our weighing tool it's how we weigh things to know what is good bad right or wrong ethical unethical um, so how could we then deal with the evolution well there's two ways one way would be to, to take the main arguments and the main evidences of the evolutionary nar narrative as, as taught in the universities, schools and colleges and in, in the well-known books, uh, and then compare that with uh, the, the opposite narrative, the, the critique or the criticism of evolution, along with its proofs, and then kind of weigh it up, what is right, what is wrong, what is false, what is true, what is you know wheat from the chaff, and then whatever is left, we can then examine that in the light of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the consensus, uh, the Ijma. But to do that, one would have to be a genius to know the various fields of evolution, paleontology, you know, about fossils and bones, uh, evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, genetics and DNA, and make an honest evaluation of the pros and cons, the rights and wrongs and whatever. And that could take weeks, months, years, or for some professors and practitioners in the field, decades. I'm not equipped. I have no, uh, I have no, no sound grounding in biology, let alone evolutionary biology, uh, other than doing a basic, uh, what we call ordinary level uh, in, 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 in college. My, my field was astrophysics. Um, so that's one way. And that would be a very good way, except that it would require a lot of um, specialization. And people just don't, can't do that, nor have the time for that. The other way would be to say, look, let's just take the standard story of evolution as we're being taught it in the universities, as it comes out in books, as Richard Dawkins and, and New Atheism and whomsoever teach it and say, OK, look, we know that there is some criti criticism of it. The criticism ranges from um, outright rejection and, you know, on the on the verge of Christian creationism, 
to, well, you know, it has some errors and some shortcomings, this, that, and the other. Let's leave that and let's just say, well, let's take the let's take the standard narrative of evolution at face value, not because we think it's all true or all false, but that's how it's being taught at the moment. And let's critique that or let's weigh that in the scales of Islam. That doing that will be will have far greater benefit, it seems to me. Why? One, because we're dealing with what is being taught. And we're not getting into, is it right? It is wrong. It's a bit like, again, a side point. Um, in, a, in about a week or week and a half, we'll be in the middle night of the month, the Islamic month of Sha'ban, the, the month just before the Islamic month of Ramadan. And there is this 15th night of Sha'ban in Arabic, Arabic Laylatul Nifs min Sha'ban, the middle night of Sha'ban. And there are some hadiths, some sayings of, uh, uh, attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Sunan of Tirmidhi, in the, uh, in the Sunan of Ibn Majah and other places. Uh, there are about 10, 20 hadiths which speak about the virtue of this night, that God is more forgiving on this night than he is any other night. The thing about these hadiths is that there is a huge uh, difference of opinion amongst the, the hadith specialists, the scholars of hadith, as to are those hadiths authentic or not. One group of classical hadith scholars came out and said, none of those hadiths are authentic. They're all either weak, very weak or fabricated. You know, they're a mixed bunch, but nothing is authentic. And so for them, there is no authentic statement about the virtue of that night. That night is an ordinary night. And so they treated it as an ordinary night. But the majority of hadith masters uh, and hadith specialists, uh, including Imam Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Rajab al Hamli, uh, they said, no, uh, there are three or four or five of those hadiths which are which are sound or authentic. And so the night does have a distinction. Now, if you, and I, I don't know your background around me, but if you're anything like me, if you show me chains of hadiths, even though I've studied hadiths, uh, I've studied the sciences of hadith as part of, you know, and I have ijazat, I have authorization in one or two small books and hadiths from scholars, but you show me these changes, chains of hadiths, right? You might as well be speaking to me in Mandarin in Chinese, it makes no difference at all. Uh, Abdullah, son of, uh, Abdurrahman, son of this, he is weak. Okay, if you say so, bro. You know, I, I mean, I know I could go back to the books of Rijal, the books of the narrators of Hadith and tire, tirelessly maybe work my way through a chain or whatever, that bang goes a whole week doing that. Uh, but, you know, uh, doing that for 30, 40 Hadith and then, trying to weigh up and whatever, that's beyond, that's beyond my pay grade. That's beyond most people's pay grade, including most scholars pay grade. They may be a, a, an excellent jurist, but it's unlikely they're gonna be an excellent Hadith master of the Bukhari Muslim caliber, for example. So what do we do? Um, uh, we don't make uh, definitive statements. We end up trusting. I trust this, this sheikh, I trust that scholar, or I read in this fatwa book, or I read that in the fatwa book, and we shouldn't make a big issue about it. We differ in our action. I honor the night, I don't honor the night, but we don't differ in our hearts. Uh, that would be an honest way. Likewise, an honest appraisal of evolution, there is, it, it seems to me, even within the scientific community, it's a bit like politics, um, there are, there, there, are, there is too much to lose on this side or that side, and trying to find an honest appraisal is difficult. So doing it this way, look, let's just take the standard narrative, then we engage with what uh, people are engaging with, we're engaging with what Dawkins and New Atheism are, is speaking about, and from that angle we can just say, oh okay, you know what, when I hear this evolution stuff, I now know theologically in Islam, I can accept this and I can't accept that. And we can be more functioning and functionable as a community, or so it seems to me, and Allah knows best. So that's how I, I'd like to do it. I'm going to do it the second way and say, look, I know there's some critique, okay, uh, but let's assume at face value, the standard story of evolution is what it is. Let's examine that 
in the light of is, uh, Islamic theology or, or Islam's teachings. In order to do that, it's worth reminding ourselves, at least in the broad outlines, what is evolution saying? Okay, uh, it's not quite, uh, um, you know, it's not quite evolution says we all came from monkeys. I mean, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's one way of looking at it. But it, for Muslims, leaving alone anybody else's standard, leaving alone how we, how people treat us or don't treat us, we have to be just towards people and towards issues. You know, and obviously I don't mean this literally, but I may not like you, Rami, okay? All right, because like you're an American, right? And, you know, we Brits were once powerful and you took the ball away from us, right? <laughs> Whatever, I've got this perennial chip on my shoulder, right? But I still Islamically have an obligation to be just to you. This person here might be a criminal, right? might be a murderer, might be, you know, some real devious criminal, but I still can't be unjust to him. Likewise, in issues, um, I may not like the people who came up with evolution. I may find that a lot of people who bang on about evolution are atheists, and many of these atheists, especially if you're in Europe and Britain, they're very anti-religious. Fine, that's that's my uh, that's my opinion of them but what they're saying i can't be unjust to i have to see what are they saying and i have to see it fairly so in islam we have this thing uh where the scholars say al hukum ala shay far'un an tasawwurihi giving a ruling about something far'un an tasawwurihi comes after conceptualizing it properly comes under after understanding it properly how can i how can i make an islamic valid judgment on the uh uh the the american constitution if i don't know the articles of cons of the constitution and i just think it's all about invading countries and you think and, and, and you say to me rami no abu ali you know I, I don't know what you've read but that's not really what the constitution is about and you know based upon my my emotive feelings and my ignorance or my misunderstanding or my I just can't be bothered to find out uh, based upon oh it's about invasion I base up an Islamic ruling on that then you'll say Abu Ali look you know that's an unjust thing likewise we need not we mustn't be unjust in evolution so the first thing to do is very briefly this is not like a this is not going to be a degree course or a you know college course, this is just literally outlines, baby outlines, just to remind ourselves or acquaint the viewers who may not know much about evolution of what evolution is saying to get to the point where we can then see what Islam actually says about it. So overview of the standard account of evolution, um, quick five minutes. Secondly, isn't evolution just a theory? Quick five minutes. Thirdly, where are all the missing fossils? I mean, if evolution is true, where are all these fossils, especially about human or humanoid fossils? Fourthly, um, there are some criticisms of evolution. I'll quickly just mention them without explaining them. Anyone who wants to follow it up can do so in their own time. Fifthly, let's take the standard story of human evolution. Okay, that, that kind of you know, ape, ape to human kind of narrative. Sixthly, what does Islam say about the overall theory of evolution? And seventhly, what does Islam say about the story of human evolution? So we're going to break it in two. Non-human evolution, what does Islam say? Human evolution, what does Islam have to say? Eighthly, there is this thing that Jews, Christians, and some Muslims, but certain, many Jewish Christian scientists, uh, Jewish and Christian scientists, since the 1950s and 60s, believe in something called theistic evolution where you can actually put god in the equation and make it match up with modern day evolutionary theory is theistic evolution islamic or not that's the eighth one and the ninth one how whatever the answer is of these you know uh human evolution non-human evolution theistic evolution we're still left with some hominid fossil records Re fossils of human-like creatures that walked on two legs, bipeds. What are they? Fabricated, not fabricated, 
a joke, not a joke. And the 10th point is just one small saying to consider in all of this, inshallah. So will that be OK for we work through these things uh, and you can uh, uh, you guys can stop me at any point, inshallah, to Allah? Is yeah. That, would, that, would that work, do you think? Of course, hundred percent. I think this is the, probably the best route to take, mashallah. I can tell you put a lot of uh, work into this, mashallah. I know it's going to be good. I am definitely excited for it. And I think it's really good, especially that you broke apart, um, like human evolution and animalistic evolution, and because a lot of the time, you know, evolution is such a broad term. It can, it does, you know, include both. Um, but sometimes when people say it, they mean animalistic. And other times when they say it, they mean human. So I think mm -hmm. that's amazing. Jazakallah khair. And Rami. Okay. So, um, so I'll be brief about all these. First thing, theory of evolution, the kind of standard story. So don't worry about if I've kind of like overgeneralized or what, because my idea, my, my, my goal here is not to actually teach anybody evolution here. Okay. Uh, but just to give some outline sketches. So these are broad strokes. Um, Generally, when people talk about evolution, when science talks about evolution, it ref it's referring to way, the way that living things change or evolve over long periods of time. Normally, evolution is to do with the way things change or evolve over time. Those things may be plants. Those things may be fish. Right. Those things may be humans. OK, but it's about. Uh, living things evolve primarily it's about living things evolving so it's less about plants living things evolving over long periods of time by long periods i'm not talking about a human lifetime i'm not talking about even the lifetime of an empire you know 400 500 years or whatever we're talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years those kind of time scales those kind of almost cosmic time scales uh, the second thing uh, evolution took when it talks about changes, how living things change, we're talking about change primarily at the genetic level, at the levels of genes and DNA, through, according to how we're taught it, genes adapting or mutating, okay? And these changes in, in genes, okay, uh, they're passed on or inherited from one generation of species to the next. Uh, and that's where they say the survival of the fittest com, com, uh, comes uh, comes along. So, for example, here is um, here is a, a grasshopper, right? Okay, um, hundred thousand years ago, grasshoppers. Uh, so I'm making this up, by the way. Hundred thousand years ago, grasshoppers they had half the size of legs that they do now. Okay, they just had little, little short, little stumpy legs, uh, and um, then they get kept getting eaten by predators that eat grasshoppers. Um, slowly and steadily, um, for some reason, and they won't explain what the reason is, it will just be nature selected it to happen. So we have, we'll use those terms for the time being, nature selected it, that grasshoppers, genes mutated, adapted, and their legs got a bit longer and longer. Why? To adapt to the predatory culture that they had to get away from. And because they survived longer, these grasshoppers, and they mated more, eventually over a long period of time, grasshoppers then in general took on the characteristics of long legs the fittest survived okay so that's really how the story goes in terms of all living creatures sometimes these changes they say leads to micro evolution that is changes and uh, within the same species so here is a butterfly with brilliant white wings because it's in some place where white and light colors are do dominant uh, but then something changes in the environment and uh, the environment becomes a bit dark you know the grass becomes greener and the rocks become darker or whatever and now they can be seen by any predator you know because they're standing out and they get eaten or killed or whatever and so natural selection and genetic mutation kicks in and they somehow adapt to their environment and they become dark in color. We see this actually happening, okay? That's called micro, small scale evolution. And it, we normally refer to it as adapting. And we do that with cats and dogs, right, as well. We might breed certain cats to get certain traits out of a cat or certain dogs to, you know, and that's kind of 
that that kind of inbreeding or breeding, crossbreeding is a form of adaption. Then there is the one that kind of puts religious people's heads in a spin. Other times they say the changes are macro evolution. They're changes on a significant scale whereby new species occur. One creature over millions of years gradually changes into an entirely different creature. So here's this fish. Over millions of years, it becomes a, 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 a land reptile. And the next few million years, it turns into a horse. Right. They call that micro uh, macro evolution. And in the language of uh, in the language of evolution, they call that speciation. Changing from one clear species to another entirely different species through. And there is some di discussion here about uh, gradualism and whatever. But let's let's take that standard thing through grad through gradual change. How gradual? They're not clear. OK, uh, but gradual change. So it doesn't it's not like one minute it was a fish and then the next minute it was a horse. It's unlikely to be that it's likely to be uh, transitions. That's really the story. And they say the mechanism which drives this change is not God, not something supernatural. It's natural selection. The environment and random genetic mutation. If you were to ask them, what is natural uh, selection? Don't ask that question. It's a taboo question because it doesn't have an answer. Uh, what does it mean, random genetic mutation? Because you're suggesting that this natural selection and random genetic mutation, that they seem to have an idea of what they need to be doing with creatures to help them live. Uh, no, it's all very, you know, it's all very unconscious processes, natural selection. And it's something, um, you know, it's one of the big criticisms against e evolution. Natural selection? Why don't the religious, the religious person will say, why not say God? Random genetic mutations? Why not say God? But nonetheless, God is out of the equation, according to them, natural selection, random genetic mutation. And as I'm sure you're aware, Rami, we can do good science, astrophysics, biology, chemistry, you name it, without necessarily having to bring Allah into the equation in the sense that I know that that could sound disrespectful as a Muslim. Of course, for us, uh, Allah is at the center, at the heart of everything. You know, we don't even blink. An atom, a subatomic particle doesn't even decay or come into existence, except with the will and the creative act of God. Uh, there is no might, no might, nor power except with God. And that's and we take that at its face value. Absolutely. Um, God is in control of all these. I mean, billions is short, you know, billions and billions and billions of atoms in the whole of the cosmos and all the subatomic particles and even the subatomic particles within those subatomic particles. God is creating and destroying, creating, destroying, organizing uh, all of that. And if we say, oh, well, that's that's a bit difficult. Well, that's why we say Allah, you know, because God is great. I mean, it's, there you have it. But uh, we can do science. Like, so, for example, an atheist can do just as good chemistry or biology or physics as a theist can. OK, because as long as you follow the rules, that's good science. So, yes, in one way, we don't have to bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the equation, but it does beg the question, what exactly is natural selection? What is genetic mutation? But that's that's a story. Evolution then says three major things. So if we want to know what the pillars of evolution are, you know, the five pillars of Islam, we can say the three pillars of evolution, uh, which most evolutionary biologists won't disagree on. They'll say Evolution makes claims about three different but related things, three different but interrelated things. Firstly, that all living organisms are related by common descent, whether it's fish, giraffes, human beings, gorillas, uh, you know, uh, lions, tigers, whatever, buffaloes, boars. Go back long enough and you will find that their family lines merge together, the family line, and then those family lines merge together, 
right back to one thing in the primordial soup. That's really what they say. And the second thing they say is that we can now say, especially with genetics and DNA, when org living organisms split off from each other, when quote unquote human beings split off from the great apes, when I don't know when uh, I don't know when hyenas split off from dogs. Uh, we can tell you exactly when that happened and what changes occurred at that point, because we do that through DNA and DNA sequencing. And the third thing is we can tell you the mechanism by which evolution takes place, natural selection, random mut genetic mutation. As regards to the first thing, organisms are related by common descent. If we were to use an Islamic term, we would say that scientists call that cut a definitive absolutely true as far as they're concerned it's absolutely proven beyond a shadow of a doubt any new discovery won't change that it will only enhance what is already there that's another point to bear in mind we we do rightly say science evolves and changes yeah but it that doesn't mean we, we Muslims have got to, well, we human beings have got to understand that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, whatever science said before, the new science will completely wipe out the old science. In some cases, it might. In other cases, it won't wipe it out. It will just fine tune it. OK, so, for example, relativity, Einstein's theory of relativity didn't wipe out, wipe out Newton's ideas. Uh, it refined it. It you know gave it high definition and then it applied it to places that Newton mechanic couldn't couldn't be applied to, okay, um, but apparently if they find certain subatomic particles, if they find certain subatomic particles, that will literally wipe out the existing standard model. They say, okay, this is what they're saying. So sometimes when science discovers something new it wipes out what came before. And at other times, it doesn't wipe it out, it, it enhances it. This is one of the things they say it won't wipe out because it's so clear cut. How do I know it's clear cut? I don't. I am actually just following those who I trust. Can I then, can I be in a position as a Muslim to say, it's not clear cut? No, because I could be lying. I, if I don't have the specific knowledge, I shouldn't be talking about things I don't have the knowledge on. All I can say is, According to these experts, this is what they say. But they need to be experts. Uh, also, when lineage split from each other, the DNA sequence, especially in the last 10 years, is pretty incredible. I have a friend who works, she works in DNA sequencing. Um, she, did her, um, she did her PhD in it, and now she works for, um, for some company. So I remember um, going through this with her and whatever and i realized that you know it's, it's gone on leaps and bounds and and there are some things in evolution which are so now we can say there are some things in evolution which are factual there are some things in evolution which are likely to be true but they still need a little bit more testing there are some things in evolution which are probable maybe it is right maybe it isn't time will tell evidences will tell and there are some things in evolution which are purely speculative i mean it's just like the, the the scientist she was sitting there one day or he was sitting there one day you know and just thought oh what about this maybe this yeah maybe this but it's just a hunch okay we cannot therefore say we cannot therefore give one ruling on evolution given the fact that some things are likely to be factual, something speculative, something's just a hunch, something's even false. No more than giving a ruling upon the whole of the United States of America. Islamically, are uh, is the United States of America, uh, uh, you know, are the people, are the are Americans uh, good people or bad? What are you talking about? You know, I don't know, 200, 200 million of you, right? All your, you know, whatever. How, how are we going to give a single ruling on 200 million people? Right. Um, so likewise, when things get complicated, it's difficult to give a single ruling. 
generally our scholars teach us, and I, I've heard one or two of my, my teachers over the decades say this, if you see someone give uh, a judgment on a complex matter just as a singular thing, know that that person probably hasn't studied it. I mean, they were talking in context of Islam, but you can expand that. Um, so it doesn't really matter if we don't really fully understand the theory of evolution, but what we're saying is here is a rough outline of the standard model. This is what one would learn if they went to university or picked up a, a book on evolution in a popular bookshop. Um, I don't know what your, what your popular bookshops are now, um, but you know, obviously you have them. Um, that would be, uh, that would be uh, the story. Changes over time in living organisms, sometimes changing within a species, sometimes changing to a new species through genetic mutation, ran, uh, ran, uh, random genetic uh, changes, natural selection. Um, and it's very difficult to do biology and it's very difficult for modern biology to make sense outside of the teachings of evolution. It's really difficult to be honest, okay? Uh, it has a, the thing about the standard version of evolution on the whole, it has a very powerful way of predicting and explaining things. It has a very strong explanatory potential, explanation potential. Okay, uh, let's, uh, longer than I intended, let's be brief, briefer. Two, isn't evolution just a theory? The point being is, it is the theory of evolution. And you and I, when we talk, it's a theory, it, means it's a hunch it's a guess right uh, that's how we talk in in ordinary language it's the same in american english as it is the same in english right if you just say like you know i have a theory who robbed uh, you know who robbed the bank i have a theory where my kind of where my burger went right uh, you know um then it just means that you have a hunch you you have a, a guess uh so isn't what's the big fuss about evolution is just the guess right unfortunately not Simply because something that not just Muslims, people, just people in general, we have to wake up to is that in the in the language of science, the word theory doesn't mean guess or hunch. If someone says, why not? It's because whenever you deal with science. Historically, science, even before the modern era, tended to take on words from a you know from a language and then give it a specific meaning so for example the science of hadith okay i mean hadith in the in the way that the quran uses the word hadith just means talk conversation but when you get to hadith sciences it takes on a it takes on a specific type of talk talk that is ascribable to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sunnah in the Arabic language just meant, meant a way. Now it means a, a particular way of a specific individual, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then even within Islam, it, even within the Islamic sciences, if I say Sheikh Khan, the two Sheikhs, and I say in Islam, if I say the two Sheikhs, who do I mean? Let me throw that at you, you guys. If I say to you the two Sheikhs, in Islam, who do I mean? Two sheikhs in Islam. Yeah, the two sheikhs. So in the, you know, if I was talking about something in Islam and I said, oh, and the two sheikhs said this, or the two sheikhs did that, who are the two sheikhs that I would likely be referring to? They live in the and same They are given the title, Sheikh Khan, the two sheikhs, or Sheikh Khan, the two sheikhs. I think we're all at a loss here, but did they live in the same time period? Yeah, yeah. Just assume they lived, uh, 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 the, the two of them lived roughly in the same time period. Assume. Okay, so I let think, me... I let think me that's his point. So let, so let me help you here. If I was talking about hadiths, okay, and I said the two sheikhs said the hadith is sahih, who am I likely to be talking about? Bukhari and Muslim. Mm. Yeah, yeah, Bukhari and Muslim. But if I said to you, uh, now talking about Islamic history, early Islamic history, the two sheikhs did this or that. 
it's unlikely to be Bukhari and Muslim, right? Who, uh, who would the characters be here likely to be? Think, think of the obvious ones. One of the four Madahab? Uh, early Which Islamic was... history. Mm. And two sheikhs did this. So it will be Abu Bakr and Umar. Okay. If I say the two... If I'm talking to you about the humbly school, the humbly fiqh, for example, and I say the two sheikhs said this or that, then it means Ibn Qudama and Ibn Taymiyyah's grandfather, who is called Majd, Majduddin Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qudama. They are the two sheikhs. But if I was talking about Shafi'i fiqh, it would be Imam Nawawi and Rafa'i. So the, word, the title two sheikhs actually means different things or different people in different subjects. Sometimes you can get a, a, a word that means something in ordinary language and it means something specialized in a science, like in hadith. Theory is the same. In science, the word theory is, it roughly means a fact. When we say the, the, the atomic theory that all the stuff in the universe is made up of small bits of matter called atoms, and even if we know atoms are made up of smaller stuff, but it is small. That is not hu a hunch. That is a provable fact. Okay, that actually atoms are the building block of matter. I mean, even though we can go smaller than that, subatomic. Likewise, uh, um, uh, uh, the theory of relativity. It, since 1905 and 1915, Einstein's general, special and general relativity, it's gone. It's undergone a hundreds and hundreds of tests and come out triumphant in each test. Its, it's claims are beyond, beyond uh, speculation. They are now, so much of the relativity is factual and well proven from the fact that time slows down when objects are traveling to close to light speed, okay, to uh, time dilation. All of those things have been established practically in, 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 in practice in, in uh, laboratories. Um, so here theory means in science, it means an overarching explanation that describes some aspect of the natural world, which is supported by evidence and rigorous testing. Evolution as a theory has a lot of evidence for it in general. So I'm not talking about evolution of human beings or evolution of rabbits. I'm just talking about evolution in general. Uh, and it has gone through rig rigorous testing. What do the scientific community use as hunch? They use the word hypotheses. When you hear a science, scientist say, um, I have a hypothesis, that means that scientist has an educated hunch which has yet to be tested, fully tested, and it yet has solid evidence to back it up. When it does, when it is fairly rigorous, rigorously tested, and when it does have evidence to back it up, it generally moves from hypotheses to theory. Theory in science generally means fact. It means that under this umbrella of theory, there are a number of key things, core things, which are factual, but they might also be under the umbrella of this theory, some things which are a bit speculative, a bit guesswork, but there are certainly facts under there, and that's why it's become a theory, okay? It is embarrassing sometimes when we find less so Christian and Jewish Western theologians, but when you get Muslim Western theologians who, when they respond to the question of evolution, they say, oh, it's just a theory. It makes Muslim scholarship uh, look bad and laughable, okay? And, uh, you know, and, uh, and Islam simply doesn't deserve uh, our our lack of trying, right? Okay, it's not, it, it, we have no right to make Islam look bad and make Abrahamic monotheism look trivial in the eyes of a people who are in desperate need of it, all right? Of, of Tawheed, of Abrahamic monotheism. Um, so we can really park this car, right? That, oh, it's just a theory. No, you know what? That's not a sensible thing to say because the word theory generally means a fact, which is open to improvement and modification, but there are factual things under it in Um The issue of uh, fossil records, all I'll just say is uh, on that, 
Uh, let me just get there were all the fossil records. If you speak to any paleontologist or read any book on fossils and paleontology, it, we all know that actually it's under very rare circumstances that a fossil could be preserved in mud or some rock for millions of years. Normally, the norm is fossils and bones of creatures crumble away to dust. You have to get the right situation and the right circumstance for fossils to actually be preserved and discoverable. In fact, it is a miracle that we have as many fossils as we do. We don't have many fossils, but what, what we do, that in itself is a miracle. If only we understood how difficult it is to find fossil bones of any insect, creature or animal, because it's not the norm. Normally bones decay in the ground. Uh, so where are the fossil records? Well, um, we'll come on to human fossil records and leave uh, other fossil records. I will skip uh, the critique of the theory of evolution because I think people could just look, look that up. And the problem with us Muslims is not that we don't have a critique of it. We, we have an overbaked critique of it. Sometimes we have an obsessive, extreme critique of it, which is like kind of, you know, pulling all the conspiracy theories, bringing the Illuminati, you know, bringing this, bringing the Knights Templars, <laughs> give anything in the mix. Um, human evolution, the standard story, standard story, leaving alone modern findings, which then, you know, add a little more detail, just broadly, for Four things. Four million years ago, there was this upright, upright creature that looked like a human being. Okay. Looked like a human being. So it's called a hominid. A hominid walking on two legs, uh, small brain, big skeleton. And we now call that Australo Australopithecus or Australopithecines these ape-like hominids that look more like apes than they do human beings, but nevertheless, they are walking upright or, or close to walking upright. That's for about 4 million years ago. We have fossil records to show that, okay? Brain capacity with about a, a third of the size of modern man, tiny brain. Two and a half million years ago to one and a half million years ago, we have what they call homo habilis, handyman. This hominid, and so I'm not using the word human, I'm using the word human-like, hominid, also hominin, hominid, that walks upright, okay, we have plenty of fossil records, on top of those fossil records we have Homo habilis has a brain half the size of hu modern humans, and it has, um, it has tools, flints, and spears and whatever. And so Homo habilis is handyman because it had tools. Homo erectus about 250,000 years ago, a million years to 250,000 years ago, stronger than human, uh, stronger physique than human beings. Uh, first hominid to hunt. Uh, apparently it was meant to be quite savage. I don't know how they know that, but quite savage. You, you wouldn't want to meet it on a, on a dark street, okay? Um, Homo erectus. We have fossil records of all of these. The issue is, how do we account for these human-like creatures? Modern evolution will say they are human. Some modern evolutions would just say that, you know, leaving the first one or two, but Homo erectus and what comes after is all human. And we need to be careful about the language. To say human, human is one thing and to say human-like is another. Why? Because as Muslims, we need to start with the starting point, and I'll get into this with proofs later, that the first bashar, the first insan, was the prophet Adam, peace be upon him, Adam alayhi salam. Whatever these creatures were, we have to account for their existence. We can't just pretend that the, the fossil record uh, isn't there. Um, so 
but that is why they say modern evolutionary biology says that humans have been around for millions and millions of years because they take fossil records of Homo erectus and Homo habilis and they say, well, look, look upright, roughly like us, therefore they're human. And I'm not quite sure uh, if that for Muslims should be the right way of going around things because someone then is defining human outside of our tradition, outside of our sacred language. We rather, we say human or bashar is what? Is whatever Adam alayhi salam was. And we're pretty sure he wasn't a homo habilis or an osteopithecine or whatever, but we'll come on to that. Then about 200,000 years ago, and this is where the story really gets interesting, homo sapien, wise man. I mean, that's talking about us, okay? Uh, 200,000 years ago. But out of this 200,000 years ago, evolutionary biology says it's only the last 40,000 years where these Homo sapiens have reached what they call behavioral modernity. Behavioral modernity. In that, that these Homo sapiens about 40,000 years ago, we begin to find characteristics in them of modern human beings. Complex language, figurative art, abstract thought, jewelry for adornment, cricket bats or bats playing like uh, I'm assuming with a ball, okay? And finally made tools and burial rituals. We only begin to find all of that 40,000 years ago. We find some primitive tools with Homo habilis millions of years ago, but the real stuff 40,000 years ago. Even though this sapien creature has apparently been around according to evolution 200,000 years before but it's only 40,000 years where behavioral modernity has come so they say anything before 40,000 years ago uh, is very primitive uh, and some of them not hardly distinguishable from apes and anything from 40,000 years onwards remarkably resembles modern man in in all our diversity in China. So that brings us to the obvious question. So what does Islam say about evolution? Do, do, do anyone, does anyone want to interject at this point before we get into like literally fatwa giving? <laughs> this is what Islam says about evolution. Yeah, I had I had uh, two quick questions. So what was roughly the period of time that Adam alayhi salam was, uh, was here from now? Brilliant. Uh, in the book and the Sunnah, uh, there is nothing stated clearly about the time period. So okay. according to the Islamic sources, there is no way of telling where Adam was. Was he 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, 40,000? It's hard to tell. If we use a biblical sources, even that becomes problematic. Okay, because you'll find uh, biblical scholars differing. So there is nothing definitive that says Adam uh, was around 5,000 years ago. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we do know, however, that how many uh, prophets we had from Adam yes, until so now. Absolutely. 124,000 if the hadith in Tirmidhi is authentic. Okay, it's authentic. 124,000. Yeah, I mean, mo most scholars give it some level of hasan or So, so even, if, even if each prophet lived one year, which is highly unlikely, yeah, then, but even if there's 124,000 years. That's, or, yeah, exactly. or, or as I say, supposing Allah sent uh, two prophets to each to two communities at the same time, whatever, you mm -hmm. know, for, for for a year, then you're still talking about, you know, 60,000 60, years. So the time scale of 40,000 years or 50,000 or even 100,000 years is not improbable from an Islamic perspective. Mm -hmm. So let me repeat that again. The time scale of 50,000 or even 100,000 years is not improbable from an Islamic perspective. The beauty of Islam is it is simply silent about how long human beings have been on Earth. So they could, if we could have been around 40,000, 50,000 or 100,000, who knows? We, mm. but we certainly are not committed to the belief of, of 5,000, 5,500 years Definitely. like Orthodox Jews and you know, a medieval Christians, or well, not even medieval Christians, that you'll find some Christians in the United States still believe that. Right. That's crazy. Um, my second so, question so is... we're not committed it to... Just a look here. My second question is, how, how tall approximately was Adam alayhi salam? Um, so I'm going to be brief about this. 
uh, though the, had the hadith in Bukhari that he's 60 cubits tall, so that's the size of, um, that's like the size of like kind of a, um, about three, three, four houses on top of each other. Okay, pretty tall. Okay, but there may be, there is some discussion. I say some and not much because there's a lot of silence on it. It's clear that he's 60 cubits tall in paradise. It's then not so clear, is he 60 cubits tall on earth? And classical scholarship doesn't say much more about that. But every time 60 cubits comes up or we will return to the height of our father in paradise. So one, one Sahih Hadith in Bukhari says, and the people of paradise, they will be the same height as their father, Adam, which was, we know from the other Hadith, 60 cubits tall. Um, mm -hmm. so, so some modern day scholars suggest, some, that perhaps 60 cubits is the Adamic height in paradise. Uh, mm -hmm. And Allah knows best if it is only he was that tall only in paradise or was he that tall here on earth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Alhamdulillah. Y'all two got any questions before he goes in? No, I say we continue, inshallah. Okay, bismillah. So, so bismillah. Does Islam allow us to believe in the theory of evolution? Well, as uh, Brother Rami kind of uh, uh, nicely made clear, if by evolution, oh, 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 let's take it from this way first, actually. If by evolution we mean one species evolving and adapting to their environment, um, whilst remaining the same species, in other words, microevolution, uh, then yes, we believe in that. And to deny this type of evolution is Islamically unwarranted and it's kind of rationally silly because we've had this going on, you know, from thousands of years past, you know, even in the time of the Prophet, وسلم, there were breeding horses okay, to get better horses and whatever, perhaps not like we moderns do, but they were doing something like that. If by evolution we mean macroevolution, one species evolving into an entirely different one over long periods of time, then, yes, we can believe in this type of evolution, providing three conditions are fulfilled. We can conditionally believe in this type of evolution, one species evolving into a completely different species, one living species into a totally different living species over long periods of time. Three conditions. First condition, that we don't include human beings in this evolution. We will cast them out and we'll talk about that a bit later. Secondly, if there is solid scientific proof or speciation, one species turning into another. Personally, as just a so this is not fatwa, this is personal, and you can just throw it out with the window if you don't agree. I actually believe in the fossil record of uh, a, a fish becoming an amphibian and an amphibian becoming uh, a, a type of pony or a, a pony or a horse. It's one of the few full transition fossil records, and I actually believe that actually that happened by, you know, obviously by Allah's will. Um, however, it's not like a belief as in like, you know, that I hold, you know, <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, um, from the evidence that I, that I, I go for it, just like the evidence I, I, I don't think that um, Elon Musk or, or some mega tycoon is, not Elon Musk, who's the one who's accused of trying to put chips into the covid vaccines it's definitely one of your guys bill gates yeah bill gates bill gates poor soul um you know i, I don't believe that okay now someone might say well i i, I think i have evidence for it bismillah <laughs> don't take the vaccine uh but you know um there you have it um so i that's what i believe in this kind of thing it's not like an aqid of ahl sunnah wal jama'ah orthodox islam either but you know uh, that's i've done my research and i think that's the conclusion i come to
Um, point being is, if the scientific proof is correct, one should believe it. If it's not correct, one can't believe it. If it's speculative, up in the air, Bismillah, we don't have to take a view. So firstly, leave human beings. Secondly, if scientific proof, uh, proof for speciation is sound. And thirdly, if this did happen, like the fish to the horse, if it did happen, speciation, then I can only believe it happened with another four conditions. One, that Allah is the creator of everything. Not Allah was the creator of everything. Allah is the creator of everything. And by everything, we Muslims mean everything. We're not talking about big things only. We're talking about everything. Brother Fayyad's blinking at the moment. Allah created that act. It's involuntary in us, but Allah is the creator. You, you've got neural networks in your brain and your synapses are firing away as they are with mine. Okay, Allah's created those firing away and anything else that's happening. That subatomic particle, whether it's a quark or whether it's string theory, the, the, the uh, alleged string theory happening subatomically and the quantum processes, Allah. Allah is actively creating, recreating, sustaining, removing, destroying, giving birth to uh, new things or creating new things on and so forth. Therefore, this, this fish to horse, Allah at every step of the way, there wasn't a blink of a second except that the divine hand was involved, point one. Point two, nothing can happen except by Allah's will. Natural selection and genetic mutation, even if let's say they had their own power, they couldn't overpower God's will. Three, that cause and effect are created by Allah and have no independent autonomy. The drink does not quench the thirst. But Allah somehow, and it doesn't matter how, somehow uh, allowed the drink to quench my thirst. And then Muslim theologians differ on what the process is and we're not required the salaf didn't get into the process and we don't we're not required but to believe that the drink can independently of god quench my thirst would be the fourth point shirk al asbab it would be to ascribe a quality to drink in this case which only belongs to god fire doesn't burn in and of itself drink doesn't quench thirst in and of itself medicine doesn't cure in and of itself Allah is the curer, the quencher, the burner at every step of the way. However, Allah in his kindness makes it the norm that when you put fire to paper, the normal result is combustion. When you put water to mouth, the normal result is quenching of thirst medicine to patient the normal result inshallah is cure but that is not because of some intrinsic ability within uh the water or the medicine or why there is no might nor power except with and by god so uh cause and effect are created by allah why because he's the creator of everything and so there is no cause of or effect independent or autonomous from him to believe in independent cause and effect, which is what they mean by natural selection and genetic mutations, would be what we call in theology shirk al asbab, shirk al asbab, um, associating partners with Allah in terms of the worldly means. Okay. Um, so providing I believed in those four things, God is the creator, nothing happens except by his will, he is the creator of cause and effect, uh, those things, then I could then believe if the, if the science or the worldly evidence was good, I could believe in that thing. Likewise, um, do I believe in the empire state building? Yes, I do. I believe that it, once upon a time it was the largest building in the world and it's somewhere in New, New, right, New York, right? Yeah, New York, right? Uh, and provided I believe that whoever put it there 
actually Allah was the you know the creator of it through human beings. Da, 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 da. Um, and I can believe in that because um, in I've never been to New York, okay, but I've seen images of it on TV, and I have friends and relatives who have gone to New York and have seen it, and I trust what they say, and it's mutawatir, okay. Um, likewise. Uh, anything in science could be like that. I trust it, or I've seen it, or someone reliable has shown me, or it's just mass transmitted. Because our ulama, some of our ulama say, when Allah says in Surah Al-Asr, وَتَوَاسُ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاسُ sabr," And Muslims help one another on the truth and help one another on patience. Truth doesn't just mean religious truths and revealed truths. Truths mean any truths. So as a Muslim, I'm not allowed to lie and say there is no such thing as the Empire State Building. There's no such city as New York. It's all fake news. When I know that not to be right. I'm, why? Because Muslims aren't allowed to tell falsehood about anything. We can get it wrong. We can be misled, but we can't intentionally lie about anything or anyone. Lying is creed blind, color blind, person blind, everything blind. Truth is truth, and the believer is expected to hear, adhere to it. If the science is good, one can believe in it. But hey, Brother Fayed, you don't have to trust my opinion of the, the fish to the horse transition fossil records. You may see the same fossil records as I, or read the same evidence as me, and come to your own conclusion. Well, that doesn't really do it for me. And as long as you are being just and fair-minded about it, Bismillah, why not? And we still go away as, as, as brothers in faith and have our burger. Okay, um, so we can believe in all of these things if the fossil records are good. Um, and are they good or not might be dependent upon our own under knowledge of it or our own understanding of what's been, you know, what is there. So, but the question to ask, can God, forget about did God, can God make a fish into a horse? And the answer is, in Islamic theology, we have three types of categories of existence. In Islamic, classical Islamic theology, we have three types of existence we have something called wajib al wajud it must exist because you can't explain the universe without this thing that exists and has always existed and that necessary existing being is god is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay and then there is mustahil wujud it's impossible to exist can there be a, can there be Another Allah alongside Allah, na'udhu billi mandalik, mustahil, impossible. Allah is wahid, okay? Laysa kamithli hishay, there's nothing like him. He's, he's wahid, okay? Um, and then there is a middle category, mumkin al-wujud, possibly can exist. It can exist if Allah wants, and it won't exist if Allah doesn't want. And we, the creation, planet Earth, people, creatures, flower and fauna and fish, are mumkin al-wujud. He could have made us with seven fingers, let's say, if that was optimum for us. He could have made us on average seven foot, you know, seven foot ten instead of five foot six or whatever. Okay, he could have made the sky, uh, uh, you know, purple because the nature of light would have been diffracted at different wave. He could have. We know he didn't. But they are possible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do. They're not impossible. Likewise, can Allah turn a, fi a fish into? Well, he turned a group of the Israelites in their sacred history into monkeys and apes. A group of the Israelites for breaking the Sabbath. Okay. Well, that was an automatic transformation, transformational punishment. Um, I will take the responsibility of saying that on my own belief and not necessarily attribute the belief to uh, to uh, to the organisers of this podcast. Um, so can Allah change a fish into a horse? The answer is, it's possible. Did he change a fish into a horse? Well, 
that will require evidence. Can you see the difference? Can he do so? If a Muslim said no, no, astaghfirullah, that would be a real problem with Aqidah. But if a, a Muslim says, yes, he can, but did he? That's a different, entirely different kettle of fish. Or oh, question. Let's, let me fish out a bit again. This reminds me of the three categories of rationality, where it's rational, irrational, or super rational. Absolutely. So a- absolutely. Um, uh, and many people today forget the last one, super rational. OK, so it's either something is irrational or it's rational. But actually, uh, it could be super rational. You know, uh, most of the people in the West, not necessarily Muslims, most people in the West will generally say that uh, every human being is created with dignity and is deserving of some rights. You try to prove that rationally or scientifically and we, we get nowhere. Therefore, is it irrational? Well, most people in the West don't think so. So what is it then? Well, actually, it comes into the third category that you said. Okay, and in Islamic esp- uh, epistemology, uh, Madarikul Ulum, we have uh, how do we know something, you know, as knowledge? Uh, it is either through his, the five senses, seeing, you know, seeing, touching, tasting, uh, hearing, uh, so on and so forth. That's hissy, akali, through rational investigation and through logic and rational investigation, or, um, uh, or shari'i, through kind of religious means. Mm. That khabari, main, khabari, that we are informed, normally religiously informed. Right, subhanAllah. Are you, are you familiar with Hamza Tortes? Uh, Ustad Hamza, mashallah. So he started coming to my classes some, year, some years back, mashallah. He's a, yeah. Mashallah. So He's in my, in my you know, journey to Islam, uh, you know, especially like, you know, science, philosophy, physics and Islam, when all of that started, you know, the dots started connecting. I watched oh, the sure. debate between uh, Hamza Tortsis and uh, Lawrence Krauss. Krauss. Krauss, yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but no, yeah, that yeah, debate I am, I am. really opened my eyes. And wonderful. Oh, it's oh. SubhanAllah, it's wonderful to see brothers like, you know, yourself, Sheikh, and uh, Hamza and all these intellectuals in the Ummah. Right? It makes it, you know, when you when you look at, you know, Christianity, uh, Judaism, again, they're... they're you know they can do whatever but i don't see that same type of scholarship let alone you know when you go into hadith and faith and it goes really deep and it's it's very it, sometimes i find it more strict and you know higher standards than scientific principles right so my question to you is when did you start um your journey into the more you know blending the more secular you know sciences with islam and and you know taking away the dichotomy um one of the problems I feel I've always had from a young child is I've always wanted to connect dots in anything. So when I was like, you know, like when I was um, nine or 10, our teacher at primary school, like kindergarten school, read to us The Hobbit. Right? Uh, and then that stayed in my mind. And then when I was 14, I came across the book Lord of the Rings in the library. And I read that. And then I just wanted to connect the dots. Well, where did that come from? And where, you know, where did the ring ultimately come from? It, it tells you a bit, a, a bit about the origin of the rings in the appendices of Lord of the Rings. But I went out and got the Silmarillion from the library, uh, you know, which was the kind of the origin book. And, you know, I'm like that, even on kind of um, just anything, I need to know the dot, need to have the dots connected. So at some point, um, I, I asked myself the question, you know, uh, astrophysics, Allah is the creator of creation. I wonder, did he create, how did he create the Big Bang? And, you know, can we ever discover it? And those kind of things just played in my head. And at some point, I realized that this is not just a very fanciful, you know, personal thoughts, but people are struggling with these issues in terms of their faith, <laughs> whatever. I thought, oh, let me take it a bit seriously. And, um, and and try to engage some of these people, inshallah. Uh, uh, Ustad Hamza though, Hamza, though, mashallah, he's on another level when it comes to this. He's, you know, alhamdulillah, he just gets out there. Um, that Krauss debate was, um, I think, one of his earlier debates. I think if it ever happened again now, he's so much more seasoned. Um, he's oh, so much more measured in his uh, tone. But even then, it was a good eye-opener, mashallah. 
Yeah, it, it definitely. I mean, I mean, it reinforces the the philosophy that you mentioned in brief before that as Muslims we need to be just to everyone, non Muslims Indeed. included. And you know, when you look at the the manners and the way he conducted himself, the character the Hamza uh, car- uh, carried himself in that debate. And I think me and Anhal talked about it once. Um, I'm sure a lot of people that came supporting Kraus and they're pro-atheist, anti-Islam, Islamophobia, whatever you want to call it, they couldn't help but notice his his attitude, his character. But a lot of people that came maybe, you know, supporting Hamza, they didn't even know too much about atheism. They're probably still going to walk away with that sour, you know, taste in their mouth by, you know, some of the things that I've, I've witnessed from Kraus. Goes without saying. Yeah, I, I, alhamdulillah, and actually the good thing about it is Ustad Hamza isn't just like that, uh, you know, when the camera is rolling. That I, Generally, I have found that to be his character uh, when you just interact with him normally as well, mashallah. That's what I found of, of, of the brother, mashallah. And Allah knows mashallah. It. Alhamdulillah, which is mashallah, that's good. Because otherwise, generally, we can all put on a character for the camera, unfortunately. <laughs> we moderns are good at doing that. Uh, but actually to just have genuine character, you know, people. So Alhamdulillah. Allah, inshallah, Allah, Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. So no, God, uh, uh, let yeah. me just round this up with human mm-hmm. evolution. The reason why we can't believe that humans transition from something earlier, apes and these apes transition from something earlier still all the way back to the primordial, primordial soup and, you know, earlier Earth's early waters, is because the Quran is clear. The Quran is decisively clear of how Adam, alayhi salam, peace be upon him, was created. Allah doesn't say that we did not create, uh, we, 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 we do, do not make fish into horses, or we do make fish into horses. Allah is silent about uh, non-human living things evolving. Just like Allah is silent, Revelation is silent about dinosaurs. The Quran doesn't mention dinosaurs. The Sunnah doesn't mention dinosaurs. Okay, so does that mean we can't believe in it? No, it just means it's not a religious question. It's Mm. a question of empirical evidence. Is there an evidence? Is there enough evidence for dinosaurs? Whatever evidence that may be. If there is, we can believe in it. Believe in them. If they're not, we we can't. That's simple as that. Um, Likewise. Is there, does the Quran speak about non-human evolution, fish into horses? Okay. Uh, no, it doesn't, but nor does it, uh, uh, it doesn't affirm it nor deny it. So can we believe in it? Yes, but not really as a religious question per se, based upon evidence. But when it comes to Adam and Islam, human beings, Bashar or Insan, if qala rabbukha lil malaikati inni khalikun basharan min teen, and when your Lord told the angels, I am creating a human being from clay, okay? Um, and uh, for example, also in the Quran, that's the 38th chapter of the Quran. And now, again, in the 38th chapter, Kala ya Iblis, ma manak an tasjuda lima khalaqt bi yadayya. Allah says, O oh, Shaitan, or O oh, Iblis, O oh, Satan, what prevented you from prostrating to that which I created with my hands? Uh, and when your Lord said to the angels, I am creating man from clay, from formed mud. And when I have shaped him and breathed into him of my rule, of my spirit, then fall prostrate before him. Uh, these are a few verses of an, a fair good number of verses in the Quran which talk about a specific way that Adam alayhi salam, the prophet Adam peace be upon him, uh, was created, that he's created by God in a special way and and Allah has mentioned detail of the type of stuff Adam was created from and that eventually there is some mystical quality that all human beings have this rule that Allah infuses in, uh, in every human being, and infused in Adam al um, and um, elsewhere that he taught Adam the names of all things. Okay. Uh, 
So it's really hard to imagine that this is a creature that, and, and the fact that the example of don't worship Jesus just because he didn't have a father, because here is Adam who had no father and mother. So if anyone deserves to be worshipped as a deity or a, 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 as a Trinitarian belief, Adam is more deserving of Jesus. And yet you don't do that to Adam. So, oh, Christians don't do that to Jesus as well. Um, it's hard then to take all those verses and think, oh, actually, what God actually means is Adam had proto-human parents, you know, kind of ape-like, human-like parents, you know, one step away from being human. And then Adam came and was the human that's how some Christians would see it. Others will just say, well, this goes against revelation. This goes against religion. It doesn't. There's a difference between assuming we have no proof, no empirical proof that wherever Musa, whatever sees Musa Islam split, Allah split for Musa Islam. We have no proofs for that is different than saying there is no proof. Mm -hmm. or, or that it didn't happen mm -hmm. okay that not being able to furnish a proof is different than saying it didn't happen because absence of proof is not proof of absence absence of proof is not necessarily proof of absence okay um so does islam allow us to believe in the theory of evolution um non-human evolution we can do if the evidence is sound, if empirically it's all there. And that will be up to every individual Muslim uh, to investigate if they want to, or they don't have to investigate and not have any opinion about it whatsoever, although that would not be a wise attitude to take in this mm. day and age, given that evolution actually pulls people away into the realms, icy realms of apostasy. Uh, so in sound is, you know, uh, it's there. Theistic evolution in, nine, I think, about the 60s, uh, the Catholic Pope, I think Pope John Paul II, or so, whatever Pope, said, we now believe in evolution, but we believe, because the, the evidence was overwhelming. All the hundred years before, the Catholic Church was as staunch as Muslims were against this evolution idea, especially human evolution. But by 1960s, they felt it's just you have to deal with the evidences and genetics was coming into its stride. So the Catholic Church took a huge turn and said, we now believe in evolution, but we call it theistic evolution. And by theistic evolution, they said, look, God was at the start of this. He wound up the evolutionary clock. Right. And then he just left the clock there. And it unwound itself and evolution played out as it did. Very much like God kicked off the Big Bang. He wound up the cosmic clock. Then he left it there and it just unfolded itself. And over the next 15,000 million years, we come to how the universe is today. Or as you Americans call it, 15 billion years. Right? Uh, then they said evolution. The problem with that is... Theistic evolution, as the Catholics and many Jews and Christians and some Muslim scientists have ascribed to it, uh, they believe that God had no hand, whereas the Muslim Orthodox belief is there is not a millisecond, a microsecond, a nanosecond, except that Allah is creating, recreating, destroying, actively, you know, and nothing can happen without the creative will of Allah. Nothing. And that me means in its absolute sense. So theistic evolution would be kufr, would be a form of disbelief because it would be to deny that uh, it's, oh, Allah started it, but actually something happened without Allah. The, the evil, evolution processes unwound without Allah. They have independent power. We don't believe that. It's actually um, considered to be disbelief in itself. And the other thing is, it will be problematic because then you're saying that Adam came through the evolutionary process. So he did have parents. They may have been proto-human parents, but they were parents nonetheless. But the Quran is clear about non-parents. And then one would imagine that baby Adam, right, comes from these proto-human parents, not quite human, 
but Adam is the first human being, theistic evolution. Was he speaking articulately? If the answer is no, babies don't speak articulately. Well, mm -hmm. well, the Quran is very clear. Well, mm -hmm. Adam al and we taught Adam the names of all things, and then we said to uh, Ad, we said to the angels, tell us the names. They said they couldn't do it. We said uh, we said to Adam, oh Adam, tell them the names, and he told the angels the names of the objects. So Adam salam was born. So it seems like a fully mature man, but more importantly articulate and intelligent is that what theistic evolution says no um so we would have a problem with uh, theistic evolution and we would also say to uh, atheists that um evolution doesn't disprove adam's existence you may ask the uh, why because we can quite happily say that for some reason Allah put Adam in the mix of these hominids. We could we could say that. And if we said that, it wouldn't be going against any verse of the Quran or any hadith of Prophet. We couldn't say that as a creed. We can speculate it. That yeah, well, we have to account for Adam al Islam's existence. Obviously, we believe in that. So um, maybe before him there are all these hominids, and maybe this is speculation, maybe you know, this 40,000 years of modern humans. Homo sapiens having modern behavioral traits. Maybe that's when Adam alayhi salam round about that period. And by the time his his family and children and children's children grow, that becomes behavioral modernity. He teaches the sapien beings what it means to be human. It could be. And that wouldn't go against evolutionary teachings, except that it doesn't have any evolutionary proof nor would it go against any Islamic teachings as a suggestion, as a possibility. What we couldn't do is say the whole thing is a metaphor. The whole story is, is figurative because the Arabic mm -hmm. language is so clear. People generally know when experts of the language know when something is figurative and not. When you, make, when you do metaphors or when you make something figurative, you tell a story for a figurative truth. You don't go to all this detail. Detail. Adam Laysam's story in the Quran is told about six or seven different verses, uh, different surahs, and each time it's told in a slightly different angle, different camera shot. If it's figurative, why have seven different camera shots with different details if the whole thing is figurative? That actually, well, actually, he was born mm -hmm. through the evolutionary process. Why go to? Why does the Quran uh, go out of its way um, to then tell you the different types of clay that Adam was made from? Uh, min turab, he's created from dust. Third surah, uh, min salsalin min hamaim masnoon, from clay of molded mud. Min salsalin kal of potter's clay. Min tini lazib of sticky clay. Min sala min salalati min tin from a product of mud, just to cite a few. <laughs> Why go through all this detail and different textures? And what, well, if it's all figurative? No, the language is very suggestive of it is a real event. It is a real event in sacred history. And we can thank Allah that nothing in evolutionary biology disproves the, uh, the existence of Adam alayhi salam. Of course, nothing in evolutionary biology proves the existence. And if, they, uh, if we were asked as Muslims, but why did Allah do that? So why did Allah do what I suggest that he could have done, which is maybe amongst the, uh, uh, you know, the hominids were there, Osteopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, okay. but actually they they weren't humans. They were human-like. But human is maybe the one who has the ruh and can know spiritual truths and not just material truths. Okay, and maybe this forty because they can't explain evolutionary biology currently can't explain what happened at the year forty thousand years ago. Where did this quantum leap come from that all of a sudden you have 
articulation, you have proper structured language, not grunts and groans, and you have abstract thought, which only human beings can do. And then you have, you know, delicate jewelry and delicate tool making, paintings. Where did all, all that creativity come from? Um, of course, evolutionary bio biologists will say, oh, inshallah, well, this won't say inshallah, but they'll say, you know, give us five, 10, 20, 30 years, we might find the answers. But I'm saying perhaps, perhaps that was the divine intervention of God for some wise reason. And there, therefore that accounts for not only the previous fossil records, they weren't humans, they were humanoids or hu hominids. And it might even explain uh, behavioral modernity. There is a clue to this, Brother Fayyad, a clue, a possible clue in the verse of the, in this verse of the Quran, and I'll begin to finish now. Remember in Surah Al-Baqarah that Allah says to the angels, he tells the angels, I'm going to create a Khalifa, a vicegerent on earth. And what their response is like, you know, I don't want to make it into like a, you know, uh, a drama on Netflix, but their response is like a bit, bit of a shock. Will you create on earth one who will uh, uh, cause corruption and shed blood whilst we do praise uh, your holy name and glorify you? And Allah says, I know what you do not know. How do the angels know that this clay creature called Adam, in whom at that time the texts more or less tell us the rule hadn't been infused in him yet, so they hadn't made such that to him yet uh, at that time. But they can see this clay creature. And Allah says, this clay creature I'm going to put on earth as, as my khalifa. And they, they, are, <clears throat> they are a bit shocked. How do they know that this clay creature is going to do that? <clears throat> is going to cause mischief. Not this clay creature, but his descendants. <clears throat> well, an answer could be, <clears throat> an answer could be, That there were already creatures like him before him who weren't quite him but could resemble him in many things and they were just doing madness down there when we look into our tafsir literature <clears throat> there is nothing like this what there is though is this not from a verse of the quran nor from any sound hadith not even from a weak hadith but from the Israeliyat traditions, that means traditions that we learned from the, uh, mainly from Jewish rabbis who became Muslims. And then it gets, some of their stories get woven into our tafsir literature and we call them Israeliyat, I mean, Israelite narrations. Israelite narrations to be found in Ibn Kathir and Tabari and elsewhere, Baghawi, Qurtubi, tell us that before Adon Islam was put on earth, there were jinns on earth and they were causing bloodshed and mischief and whatever. And Allah sent the angels to clear them away for Adam and Islam. Now, providing there isn't an ijma, a consensus on this point that they were jinns, and providing it is just a Jewish law, you know, from Jewish law that we took in. We didn't believe in it nor disbelieve in it because the Prophet said when the children, are, when the people of the book narrate to you, neither believe it nor disbelieve it. But it's come as a story that actually bef uh, who populated the earth before Adam al -Islam and his progeny? Jinns. Maybe they weren't jinns. Maybe they were hominids. If there is no ijma on this point, then that gives us flexibility to posit the possibility that maybe they were hominids. And Allah cleared them out because of, of, of Adam al Islam and, and what we now call modern Homo sapiens, which is Insan Bashar. And that could be a possible way of squaring the circle. So, in brief, we can believe in evolution of non human species, providing we believe that the empirical scientific evidence is solid. We cannot, as a Muslim, believe that Adam came through the, bio, uh, the evolutionary process 
nor could we ever believe that it's a metaphor because the Quranic language is just too precise, clear, too detailed, on top of which that there are numerous hadiths, Sahih hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, that Adam was created from the topsoil of the earth of different colors, which is why we have the mix that we do and the, the temperaments that we do. And it's very difficult to make that all figurative or a metaphor. Um, well, Lalan, that's, that's what, what I understand. I've, I've run this by some of my teachers. Some of my teachers couldn't give an answer because they just don't understand biology, evolutionary biology. Um, some of them have said that this is, you know, it's all solid as long as you make sure that you're not making a fatwa out of, yeah, um, uh, they weren't jinn, they were hominids. And you make sure that you make it clear that that's an opinion that you're suggesting in the absence of an ijma, a consensus of Muslim scholars. Because if there is a consensus that they were jinn, then we can't break a consensus. Okay, so I have a very quick question. Um, it's not a consensus that they were, they were jinn. So if it's not a consensus. Yeah, yeah. So is it a consensus or no? So as far as I know, it's not, but um, it does require, I, I do need to look into it a little bit more, but uh, generally where generally you'll find Israelite narrations aren't a point of consensus because they're just, you know, we, you know they're not like prophetic statements there. Yeah. The, the Jewish <laughs> rabbis got it from their Jewish rabbi, got it, you know, and we don't know right or wrong, left or right or whatever. And we know sometimes they went overboarding things anyway, which is why yeah. we have a relation. So assume, assume for now that it's not a consensus. Okay, okay, that's fair. Um, so I, I'm assuming that you you haven't heard any other opinions. Indeed, that, oh. and none of my and none of my teachers have pulled me up on that. Okay. And normally you you know the, I have one or two teachers who would definitely pull me up on something. Okay, okay, jazakallah khair. Uh, subhanallah, I think that was amazing. Like especially the end, attempting to square the circle, subhanAllah. Um, given again that it is just a possibility, it's not something that we should go out and, and promote as okay, this is the hub. Brilliant. Bless you, bless you, Rami. That's exactly it. You hit the nail on the head. It's a possibility, it's not something we make dawah to. Yeah. Jazakallah khair. Um but at the same time. But at the same time, it's it's it, it's really beneficial, I'd say, uh, to people who are looking at uh, evolution and they think, okay, this is the truth. There's so much ev evidence for it, and saying that, okay, it does not line up with Islam. It's this is amazing because we can go to them and say that's not necessarily true. That's Absolutely. not necessarily true. Absolutely, and 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 I wrote, personally believe that should be our starting point. Yes. Um, on top of which, the added benefit is it gives hope. And remember your question right at the beginning, you know, like kind of um, some people using science to kind of like justify Islam and whatever. It's not, uh, I, I don't blame people who do that in the sense that if you believe on the whole, the scientific method and the scientific enterprise is generally huck true. It's the best way to know the material world. We don't have a better way of knowing the material world than that. Um, and if you believe that's true and you believe Islam is true, then the natural thing is to try to square the circle. Just like the Muslim philosophers of the past, the Ibn Sinas and the Ibn Rushds of the world, Greek uh, philosophical thought was true, Quran was true, and it was a matter of trying to harmonize between them, which didn't quite work out as you know they were expecting. And likewise, the scientific enterprise hasn't quite worked out uh, like some Muslims hope for. Yeah. But it's understandable why someone will do that, but we should just approach, we should start from the point of, I know this sounds a bit blasé and I don't mean it to sound blasé, but it's irrelevant what, what non-Muslims uh, and anyone else thinks outside of our tradition. Allah has re uh, uh, revealed to us a book and he sent to us a prophet, alayhi salatu uh, a prophet until the end of days and a book until the end of days. And regardless of what anyone feels about it, it is not a book of science or geography or mathematics. <coughs> or it's a, it's a book of guidance. And he saw mm -hmm. was a prophet of guidance. Uh, and, you know, um, that's we're not going to budge from that point in Charlottetown and try to be over over scientific or over rational about it. Yes. Yo, Rami, real quick. I don't want you to give, give it away. Mishik, how old do you think Rami is? Mashallah. If you want, if you want, if you want a hint, 
I'm 23 and Anhel's 26. So just, Seriously? just some, yeah. So just take I, a guess I, at how. I I imagine Rami to be younger than you both. Yeah, he's he's 17. No. <laughs> brother Rami, are you, brother Rami, 17? I'm not 17. No, no, no. I'm not 17. Oh, I'm not 17. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm 20. Oh, I'm you're 20. using that oil of you layer or whatever. No, no. <laughs> no how, so you must, you know, I, I pitched you at all the same age, uh, roughly the same age, give or take correct. a few years here. You're and correct. He's, he's younger. He's younger, but he's brilliant. Mashallah. Mashallah. Allah bless you all. Mashallah. I mean, I it's, um, Alhamdulillah, it's been a pleasure. I, I, I hope I. I hope it wasn't too tedious, but it is one of those topics that is really hard to condense down, even though I did try my best to condense it. Yeah, yeah. I honestly, I think I think it was amazing, subhanAllah. I myself, uh, not as brilliant as Fayad likes to try and make me seem, uh, alhamdulillah. But um, <laughs> subhanAllah, I think, I think it was really well done, mashallah. I think it was great. And as tedious as it might seem to some people, um, I think if they make it to the end, uh, it, tying it all together, 100% worth it, 100% worth it. Allah fikum, may Allah bless you. Allah fikum. Allah fikum. And, and, and I just hope that more people kind of just take the time out just to try to square the circle and, and they'll find that the divine hand, inshallah ta'ala, will assist them, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah, yeah inshallah. And, you know, people like yourselves, you know, may, may Allah bless you all, um, three Muslim podcasts. Uh, why uh, Why did you I mean obviously I know you're three Muslims uh, <laughs> is, there a, is, there a, is there a deeper reason Behind three Muslim podcasts You said it yourself That's that's literally it That's it I, I think it's brilliant It's a, it's very it's very catchy And it's very you know Alright Yeah, let me, let me check yeah this I, out. I came and up the with three, the And name. the three characters So the link you sent me The thing, first thing I noticed is Mashallah Three different characters Or what yeah. but, You know I, I assume like you were College friends Or university friends Or you know, whatever, but three different characters. What's, so, what's, so you, ha- yeah. so you haven't disappointed me. So I have seen you in this chair, laid back, and I thought, mashallah, this guy, <laughs> mashallah, this guy's Mister. Like, so we used to in the old days, like back in the seventies, we used to have a drink called Horlicks, when we, and it would kind of calm you down and whatever. Now we just do espressos and cappuccinos. But it, so when I hear you, it's like, yeah, Horlicks. <laughs> 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 So you haven't disappointed, mashallah. May Allah, may Allah get us to a, a, a position where we're as relaxed and laid back as Anha. I mean, subhanAllah. One point. Any, any final questions or um, should we, we can begin to wrap this up? What do you think? Yeah, inshallah. So one thing I wanted to ask was um, you mentioned uh, the, I think that the basic uh, mechanism uh, for for Darwinism or for evolution, which is Darwinism, which is um uh, natural selection through uh, random mutation or by random mutation, um, is that I know you gave an overview of evolution, so like I, I guess it's bound to be mentioned, but would it be a good idea to just use an even more basic understanding of evolution, which is removing the mechanism itself um, for the overview, because there are I mean, you did have a portion that you missed out on in, in this particular podcast, um, which is the problems with, with evolution. Is that a, p- a problem with Darwinism necessarily or just evolution as a whole? I'm, I'm not aware of any school in evolutionary biology which excludes natural selection and random genetic mutation from the equation as the driving mechanism. Yeah. Um, If Darwin proposed it just from the top of his head, um, no one has improved upon it, as far as I'm aware. Uh, And Allah knows best. Mm -hmm. And it has the the problem of these are tying kind of two nebulous nebulous terms, aren't they? Natural selection. That in itself is very mystical, kind of nebulously out there. Yeah. Um, so that could that is a, a, that is obviously a great criticism. Something just out there somehow is guiding, but then they're saying that it's not guiding; it's just random, and it just turns out like that. And then you come into look, it turns out like that, finely tuned, and every, all these things begin to gel together. Yeah. When you kind of, I think, when you look at one aspect of something and you don't take a, a step back and see the bigger picture. Mm-hmm you might fail to realize the wonderment of the astonishment of the whole thing. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. But if you are able to step back, then as we know, you know, it is it is amazing. And it's really just hard to believe, hard to believe that it's all chance, yeah. random mutations, nebulous natural selection. Yeah. You know, and there you have it. And obviously the, the question is it goes back to even something more basic than that. Forget about how did life on planet Earth get here. But the, even the the even more basic question is just how did life in the universe get here? Yeah. How did the universe itself get here is, is really the Quranic starting point, yeah. even if it doesn't couch it in that language. You mentioned in one of your, <clears throat> excuse me, your earlier works that the laws of entropy, it just completely goes against natural selection. Yeah, indeed, because entropy finds its way in throughout all science where you you go through something quite systemized you know a system that is quite you know constructed and it kind of dissipates and it gets more uh, reckless and more undefined uh, with evolution strangely enough the very reverse happens you come with all these kind of you know random chaotic earth and over time you end up with human beings with intelligent creatures like monkeys and dolphins and what and then human beings so it's gone against the very the normative scientific principle that entropy increases meaning chaos and disorder increases with time mm-hmm. okay when you come to the species of evolution the very opposite is happening yeah. so how do you how do they explain that as well uh, then the fossil records is you know, uh, an issue, and merely because a, a fish to a a fish to a, a reptile to a horse, even if we we would say that's hundred percent proven, even if we were to say it doesn't mean that other things it proves other things. Likewise, merely because I have like seventy seven or ninety five percent similarity in genes between me and the great apes or me and a chimpanzee, uh, that doesn't mean that. I am descended from it no more than we have 50% similarity with banana genes. Apparently we have 50% similarity, same genes as a banana, you know, and no one's, no one on this planet is going to say we descended half from bananas. (laughs) So again, it's, it's not the science, it's the inference. It's the, it's the conclusions uh, that one may draw from there that may not be right. Um, Jurassic Park is a, a good example. You know, ju- so the, these films, Jurassic Park, um, the, you know, uh, the way that dinosaurs behave and the, the skin of the dinosaurs, they're not based upon science. They just, well, Hollywood does it for its purpose, but, you know, they are just artistic assumptions. Yeah. But there was a, a T-Rex kind of, you know, that we have good skeletons of t-rex fossils of t-rex but w- did they have that attitude did they blink like that well you know did they roar like that did, were their skin smooth no that's uh, that's all speculative so some things in evolution we might have fossils and homo habilis homo this but a lot of it's filling in the gap with this is what i think um, squares the circle and so those type of things aren't hard facts. They could be open to change. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, Yeah. No, real quick, Anna, what are your thoughts on uh, the laws of entropy directly being, you know, discordant with natural selection? I was a little absent minded there, bro, to be honest. <laughs> bro, I'm just going your leg. You're good. You're good. It's yeah. too- are, are you all in the same city? No. No. So I'm I, in... Yeah, yeah, go on, Rami. I'll let you. Me, me and Fyder are actually Canadian. Alhamdulillah. Oh, you're Canadian? Yeah. yeah. MashaAllah. So, so, so we're, My apologies we're, we're a little to closer you. to you than the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. My apologies to you. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Okay. I think... I, but, but don't apologize to Anna because he's, he's... You American. know, when I looked at Rami, I just thought, he looks Canadian. But somehow... <laughs> 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 There's something about him, and I don't know if it's your hat. But I, 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 I have this image of, of a, a Canadian Muslim uh, wearing a hat like yours. And I, I actually met a couple of Canadians. I was in Canada some years ago. Um, where did you come? When did I? Oh, sorry, where? Where did yeah, I come? Where did you come? Yeah. 
what was that big conference that happens in winter? Oh, you're talking about um, uh, RIS, Reviving Yes, that's the one. So I was uh, like uh, eight, nine, ten years ago, I was in, invited to RIS. And then I told Sheikh Abdul Hakim, <coughs> you know, like, you know, there's about 100 speakers at this conference, okay, when there only needs to be about five speakers, you know, and we can listen to them really nicely, whatever. So um, after that, I wasn't really, I'm not too interested in these kind of big events and whatever, uh, alhamdulillah, but it was really nice to see Canada. And it was snowing and the snow was right up to here. And it's like, mashallah, <laughs> amazing stuff. And the Muslims were really nice, say, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Ya Rabbi. So Alhamdulillah. you both were in Canada and and um, the third brother is? Yeah, I'm, I'm in Florida right now. You're in Florida. You're yeah. soaking up the sun. That's why you're chilled <laughs> out. Because <laughs> it's all that sun soaking, mashallah. Fantastic. Yeah, maybe. So, how do you know each other then? So, you what? You just hooked up online, or you know each other from time? Well, I met on on online. I met Rami in the gym. Mashallah. I met or Rami met on through me, and, and I think I met on history two or three years so, ago. So, have you actually Rami physically ago. met each other? Have you physically met? No, each we, other? we 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 me and Anha physically met. Me and Rami physically met, but those two haven't met. Yeah, soon, inshallah. Soon, inshallah. We're we're thinking of going on a trip as soon as uh, as soon as this this whole thing is done. Yeah. Fantastic. Alhamdulillah. Allah bless you, mashallah. May Allah increase you all in goodness and tawfiq. May Allah subhanahu wa taala um, bless your dawah and your outreach. And and cause I mean, it, may Allah bless you too. Make it a means to open up people's hearts and restore the remembrance of Allah and God in their hearts. Inshallah. 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 Same goes for you. Barakallah fikum. Allah bless you, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Anything else I can do for you, my brothers? Um, I have one really, I hope it's a quick question. Um, I've Bro. heard um, Bruce Lipton talk about um, his research in stem cells and all of that, and that uh, stem cells seem to uh, be reactive based on the environment. And it's, it's more of an mm. like, intelligent thing. Um, and I've heard things like uh, uh, Stephen Meyer's intelligence, uh, in, uh, intelligent art um what's it called intelligent design argument and all that what are you what's your opinion on all that if you have one. um so i don't have much to say about uh lipton because simply because i haven't engaged any of those ideas much uh by intelligent design um i do think i i, I do think the argument of certain complex parts of a living creature like the eye for example uh, i i find it very difficult to understand how that could have just come gradually it's either all or nothing because if it's not all or nothing it doesn't help your chances of survival if you've got an eye which is not fully formed and not functioning at all so if it's all or all or nothing the gradualism has a big hole in it and i find that even if so many years ago decades ago there was darwin's black box that argued this case and it gave an example and many years later evolutionary biologists disproved the, the claim but that doesn't disprove the idea that this idea of uh there must be a creative intelligence behind some of the, this design because it's just it's just really boggles the mind that this happened through just blind chance there's there's just there's too much there's too much artistic and complex work there to you know that that's how i see it and i, I think i i think i would have seen this allah knows this even if i wasn't a muslim mm. just it kind of it stares you in the face yeah um i probably wouldn't i probably would have if i wasn't a muslim i probably would think oh well that's just one you know that's just part of life we don't know but you know uh, as a muslim it makes me think um i don't believe the current standard theory of evolution is the final word. I think the outlines are generally that generally there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm pretty clear that the outlines are quite solid, um, but I think there is a lot of over speculation. I think science as a whole, it began to happen in my time, but it became worse after, which is if you don't tow a type of naturalistic, atheistic view in science, sometimes you have problems with funding and research. Mm. 
I have friends who have found that to be the case in their fields. And so I think, unfortunately, science as an enterprise has been slightly politicized in terms of atheistic kind of, you know, nudges. And there is no reason why science uh, and, uh, and naturalism needs to be the underlying assumption of any science. It doesn't, it doesn't naturally follow. One doesn't have to go along, go along with the other. I have an article called um, um, Science, does science point towards God or atheism? On the humble eye, does science point towards God? And I, I give three basic reasons for you know why I think it points more to the. No, does science point towards theism or atheism? Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. And you know, and as Muslims, we think that actually, actually, science does a good job pointing more towards more towards theism than, than it does atheism for sure. Yeah, yeah. Subhanallah. Um, we we always say that um, it takes more faith to disbelieve in a creator than to believe. Barakal afikum, Rami. Spot on. Barakal afikum. Absolutely, absolutely. But the way that we're now conditioned, you know, it's almost coming natural because you know we we've been so conditioned to go against the grain now. Uh, but then you know that's that's partly our failing as, you know. Uh, as Muslims, as as the last upholders of of Tawheed, of Abrahamic monotheism, uh, we need to prioritize our, you know, our Dawah. Some of the intra-Muslim schisms, you know, there, you know, every, you know, everything is important, but every, but things have priority. You know, we're not losing people to uh, to the the misguidance of the classical Mu'tazilites, right? Called the Murji. Mm-hmm. OK, uh, even though their strain of thinking still influences negatively a little bit here and there, but they, it doesn't it doesn't influence Muslims like atheism, new atheism and these type of philosophies. Uh, and some of these people, it's not that they don't want to be good Muslims. It's just that intellectually they they're not they can't see any way to square the circle. And, and they're convinced that science has done good. So we're failing them. Perhaps you're not failing them, but sheikhs, um, you know, sheikhs, mm. religious teachers and ulama in on the whole, we might be failing them. And that's just not fair. Yeah. And inshallah, this this podcast, you know, will be the start of, of something, you know, amazing, inshallah, to educate ourselves first and foremost. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for all that. And all Allah the beautiful Allah. people. So they can Rami, I'm gonna, uh, truth be told, I don't think you need to start, but I think you already started ages ago because I saw some of the people that you have on here, including Ustaz Hamza and whatever. So, mashallah, uh, you already started, mashallah. May Allah give you tawfiq to continue the journey and and, and help to reach We out. didn't. We didn't have Hamza sources yet. We want to, though. Oh, you wanted to. All right. So we you had to. others there, which I, 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 you know, I kind of skimmed some of the titles and yeah, one yeah, of yeah. the podcasts, and I thought, mashallah, this looks good. Yeah, we had Sheikh uh, Fahad Taslim. One of one of our first guests on. Mashallah, mashallah. So yeah, I, I and I'm sure um, Hamza. If I, when I speak to him next, um, I'll, I'll just say that I I did the three podcasts, and you know they'd love to have you on. So I think if you give him an invite, he'll, he'll accept. Inshallah, Inshallah. And uh, Inshallah. if you want to see a character, and if you want to see like kind of like I, I'm kind of like like in you know, let's say I'm much much older than. Um, uh, than Ustad Hamza so you'll see vibrancy and dynamism otherwise I'm like um, sorry how do you pronounce your name brother An- An- Angel Angel how do Angel. you spell it? Spell, it, spell it for me A-N-G-H-E-L Angel okay Angel. so what kind of name is that Spanish Puerto Rican oh Puerto Rican Spanish okay Angel All it's, right. um, it's, it's Romanized I think because so how would you say how would you say in Spanish? Angel. 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 So nice. it basically means angel, but it, wow, it's written wow. with an H. Mashallah. <laughs> hey, I'm not an angel, brother. I'll tell you that though. <laughs> Allah knows best. No, but no, of course you couldn't be because we're talking about evolution and human beings. So you, yeah, you've got to be a human being. Facts. Mm-hmm. Facts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. uh, I, I, I kind of, uh, people say that I come across pretty relaxed, but not like Angel, right? Yeah. When you see Ustad Hamza, mashallah, he's vibrant on the way. He'll, he'll keep you on your toes until the end. 
<laughs> we, we look forward to that, inshallah. We, we really look forward to having one. Inshallah, inshallah. I'll, I'll put in a word for you, inshallah, Tyler, even though I don't think you need a word put in, but I'll put in a word nonetheless, inshallah. Jazakul khair, my brothers. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure, honestly. Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, just to meet you as well. Just you know, really, really, really nice. You know, three nice people, mashallah. And thank you for the opportunity of uh, of going through this uh, this evolution stuff. And Jazakul khair for making the time yourself and for being here and spreading truth where you can. Yeah. Well, yeah, Khabib. Well, yeah. Honestly, the pleasure is all ours. May Allah bless you, Masih, Sheikh Habibi. Amen. Um, to all those watching uh what should the hashtag be if you made it this far into the episode hashtag i want to put that drink that you said on hell <laughs> how do you spell Horlicks, Horlicks. hashtag h-o-r-l-i-c-k-s yeah <laughs> if you made it this far put the hashtag if you made it this far into the episode may allah bless you uh habibi sheikh abu alia immensely we appreciate it um if you made it this far may allah bless you immensely with that being said allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab an-nar assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh you know you could do this without school you already know that you can bring in money now the question is can you bring home some paychecks and show that to mommy and daddy can you prove it that you can do it because at the end of the day they still have this traditional Eastern philosophy that you need to go to school. We came here, we sacrificed our life for you to go to college so you can get this degree and make this money. Whereas, bro, I keep preaching this. You don't need school if you don't need school. If you're not trying to be a doctor, you're not trying to be a lawyer, you're not trying to be some type of engineer. I'm talking about an actual practical engineer, right? Not like a programming, uh, you know, software engineer that can, that's, you can do it from your laptop, bro. Now, these types of things go, go to school. But you don't need one to be a software engineer. Can you be a software engineer through school? Of course. Can you be one without school? Of course. So why take the route that you might have to uh, indulge in riba, in interest, in student loans? 